the first kind of leader, and I would call this more of an old school leader. Um, it, this kind of leader um, was prevalent uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and the early 90s. But, um, and it works in certain situations, uh, especially in a crisis. Um, but you've got to be careful if you are what we call an authoritarian or a dominant leader. Now, what we mean by an here are the needs of an authoritarian leader. This is what they need to feel safe. They need their team to have results, and they need movement. They need forward movement. And if things feel stuck or if things aren't getting done and it feels like the team is, is just not moving forward, they absolutely are threatening to go into a sabotage pattern. And so here's what they hate. Dominant uh, authoritarian leaders hate external controls being put on them. They hate being controlled by outside circumstances. Um, and they also do not suffer f fools. Incompetence drives them crazy. Now, a bunch of you are going like this because you're already identifying it. Here are the strengths, though, that an authoritarian leader can bring to a team. By the way, when we say a team, great teams are not yes people. Great teams are marked by diversity of thought. And you want the different styles of leadership on your team because each brings strength and each can can ground one of the other kind of, of uh, leadership uh, qualities when it gets out, of, uh, gets out of whack, so to speak. And so we, we uh, do not in any way believe that, that we've all been a part of a team that we felt that we had to say what the leader wanted us to, uh, to say or there would be a price to pay. That is not a world-class team. A world-class team is when you can bring your real self to the table, you can be in your natural leadership style, it's understood, it's appreciated, it's valued, and it's welcomed. And when you get those blend of those leadership styles, now you're cooking with gas. You with me? So, so again, I want to get it in your head that great teams are not afraid of pushback. They're not, not only not afraid, they welcome pushback. They welcome diversity of thought. They're not concerned who made the idea. They want the best idea, period. And they don't care where it comes from. And when you have a diverse team that has different kinds of leadership styles and different kinds of thinking, you are much more apt to do that as long as you have a leader who doesn't shut down the rest of the team. And that is the challenge of an authoritarian leader. Now, here are the strengths that an authoritarian leader brings to the table. They can move a team forward. They can bring energy to the team and say, come on, you guys. Uh, we got to go up this mountain. Come on. Come on with me. Let's climb that thing. And so they can allow a team to, to have motivation to do things that are outside of their comfort zone. Um, they can create confidence in a team. An authoritarian leader can bring clarity. They take charge. They're decisive. Uh, they're inward directed. They, they, they trust their gut. Um, and they don't have to have 100% of the, of the information before they make a decision. Uh, they're very intuitive leaders. Um, they're also, they don't have a problem um, expressing opinions in a very straight, frank, um, direct manner. Um, they're clear, they're concise, they're big picture, um, they're outwardly uh, secure, and they dislike indecisiveness. You ever been around a leader like that? Now, so here's the challenge. If a leader is not self-aware, is not able to read a room and modulate their leadership style, they will become ineffective in their style. And so here's what they look like. Here's what an authoritarian dominant leader looks like when they're not focused on the people in the room, 
What are, they, what are they thinking? They're not reading them. They're not adapting them. In fact, they have no clue of what's going in the room because there's so much into their own words. How many of us have ever, ever been there? That you miss the social clues that were going on in the room because you're so caught up in what you're doing. You're going to miss the social cues in the room, the body language, the verbals, the shifting seats. You're going to miss verbal cues in the room that, wait a second, back up, you're starting to lose them. And so this is what a, an authoritarian leader looks like when they're not picking up the cues. Um, they start pushing a team too hard. Um, they, get a, they get so far ahead of the team that, that, the, that they lose the pulse of the team. Uh, you're so far ahead of the team, you're not even aware of where they are that the team begins to see you as an enemy because they've lost connection with you. Um, and when an authoritarian leader um, is lacking emotional intelligence, they begin to be driven. And a driven leader will drive people away. A driven leader does not attract people. A driven leader, the energy, the my way or the highway attitude of an authoritative leader who is lacking emotional intelligence, they will actually push people away. Um, and others feel that they can't do it right. No matter what, if I don't match what this person's expectations are, I'm in trouble. This is a leader who will often, in working with NFL teams, I would call it in this, they lose their locker room when they're in that place and they don't even know they've lost the locker room. You guys uh, from UWGB, your coaches, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I remember when I was in my early 30s as a young leader, I was that leader. Now, you can shift your leadership styles if you have enough emotional intelligence and people who are willing to hold you accountable in a respectful way uh, when you are going back to a default leadership style that's not effective for that moment. Um, and I remember when I was in my early 30s, there was a gentleman, I was, I was the pastor of a, a large congregation in, in uh, the state of Indiana, and I had a, a guy in my congregation that uh, owned a bunch of coal mines. He was business savvy. He was a great leader. Um, <clears throat> we had a congregation that was growing like crazy. Um, and he took me out to lunch one day, and I, I was really angry at that point in my life. I was angry at my congregation because I felt that I was the one, the only one who truly was committed to our vision. No one else worked as hard as me, and I felt like I was all by myself. And I was resentful, I was judgmental, um, and um, thinking that I've got a bunch of slackers around me. Um, and so this guy, his name was Kent Solitros. He took me to lunch one day. And he said, Fred, and I'll never forget this. Every one of us have had one or two conversations in our lives that when they were having them, we hated them. They felt so painful. Have you ever been there? And yet, 10 years later, you look back upon that conversation and it was one of the greatest gifts that you've ever been given. And you were so thankful because it helped you make a pivot in your life. Well, this is one of those pivot points for me. And we sat down at Mary Ann's restaurant. Not that I don't remember the impact of that day. And uh, at Mary Ann's restaurant, Ken Solitra said, Fred, I need to talk to you. You know I'm your friend. You know I love you to death. But we've got to talk. He said, Fred, you are one of the most talented communicators I've ever seen, especially for someone who's so young in your leadership. And you have the ability, uh, because of your charisma, to pull a team together. Um, and he was describing my authoritarian leadership style when I was in my natural place. But then he lays the load on me. He said, but I know you've been talking about that you're so exhausted. 
you feel like you're all by yourself. Well, let me tell you why you're all by yourself, Fred. You are all by yourself. Because you have made it very clear to everyone else that you're the only one who really knows what the score is around here. You're the only one who really has it all figured out. And don't think we haven't figured you out. And every time we put together a board or a committee or a group to take on a task, you will always micromanage it. It has to be, you've got to look at it, and if it's not exactly the way you want it, you'll put red lines all over it, and you'll, set, you'll do it yourself. And you know what? Here's what we've decided to do, Fred. You are by yourself, and you've got what you wanted. And Fred, if you don't change your leadership style, that you begin to de delegate and to appreciate the thoughts and the contributions of the rest of the team, and that you're not the only one around here who knows how to think. Because if you don't change this, Fred, you have hit your ceiling. And Fred, it would be a tragedy if you hit your ceiling as a leader at 32 years of age. And he says, I know this is painful. I know you don't deal with criticism well. At that point in my life, I was really insecure. And, um, and I felt like I had absolutely um, been knocked over by a sledgehammer. But I'll never forget his words. He said, if you cannot modulate out of this leadership style and begin to see people as your friend and not as your asset or not as your, your, your worker base, Fred, you're going to lose people. Fred, you talk about you want to lead people up the hill. Well, you're going up the hill right now, but no one's following you. I'll never forget that conversation. Um, and so that's what a, an authoritarian leader looks like when uh, they're not self-aware, when they're not reading the clues, when they're not reading the tea leaves. What does an authoritarian look like when they really are in complete backup style? When they are at a place that they're so... Um, they have no clue of how they're coming across. They're actually cutting their nose off despite their face. They're, they're not only ineffective, they're going backwards. They're not only ineffective, they're losing trust very quickly. They're not only ineffective, that they are losing the locker room. And what do they look like? Um, this is when a, uh, when a leader, an uh, authoritarian leader feels unheard, unappreciated, they're tired, they're, they have a lack of um, uh, balance in their lives, they will go from being authoritarian to a dictatorial steamroller. In a dictatorial steamroller, I lose empathy, I begin to dictate orders, I micromanage, I mandate. I don't ask people to, to what, what they're thinking. I'm going to tell them how they need to think. And I overpower people, uh, and it's all about regaining control or the illusion of control. And when a leader is in that place, gang, they're not leading. Why? Why aren't they leading? because no one's following. I had a, I had a conversation with a, a gentleman um, yesterday, and uh, I had to deliver that kind of news to him. You are at the point that your career is on the line because the way you're treating people, you've lost your audience. And unless you're willing to own that and quit being defensive and start looking at yourself and what changes you need to make, and you need to reset some relationships. You need to own what you've done to cause the loss of trust without being defensive, without blaming them, but pointing the fingers completely at you. You can reset yourself when you've been in this place. I know that for a fact because that's where I was. It's painful. You have to take responsibility. You can't be defensive. Um, but, but an authoritarian leader in a backup place is not a leader. 